Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday Space News show where I give you a recap of the past week of Starship development, launch events, and all the other Space News stuff that I think is interesting. Loads to cover today from Starship, Long March, James Webb, Ariane Space, and more. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the number one website building tool. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's discuss Starship. It has once again been a busy week at Starbase Texas. On Tuesday, we saw cryo loading into test tank B7.1, which is still sitting in the can crusher rig. A short while later, we saw it open its top vent and all the frost fell away, and the road reopened about six hours later. Hopefully SpaceX achieved whatever it was they were hoping to achieve with this particular test, though I really do wonder what they are testing at this point, and the sadist in me really wants to see B7.1 finally explode. <laughs> anyway, as nighttime fell over Starbase, it began snowing. Just look. Oh. Oh wait. Oh no. That's not snow. That's mosquitoes. Ugh, I, I hate mosquito season. Remember, if you plan to visit Starbase at the moment, make sure you wear protection and take precautions or just don't visit after sunset, which is when things are at their worst. I think this video from Starship Gazer speaks for itself. Now, we were all speculating why Ship 24 aborted its static fire test a few weeks ago. Well, the eagle-eyed CSI Starbase may have caught the reason. He discovered a rupture in a methane line on the removed vacuum raptor, likely caused by flight debris, which would absolutely have resulted in an abort. Hopefully now that this engine has been removed from the vehicle, no more hitches will happen. Things have been getting pretty lively down at the orbital launch pad. Crews were spotted installing some new pipeworks on the launch ring, this black pipe here, which we think is associated with the new fire suppression system. No doubt part of SpaceX's plan to protect the booster and launch complex in the event of a component failure like the explosive Booster 7 spin prime test a little while ago. On Thursday, the roads were closed and the launch pad was cleared, so all eyes were once again on Booster 7. Wait for it. Ah, there's a spin prime test all right, and wow, that is a lot of Raptor engines. Certainly more than we've ever seen before. Unfortunately, we never got a subsequent static fire, but with all the works with the orbital launch mount going on, there's a chance that SpaceX weren't planning to static fire Booster 7 on this particular day. Before we really even had time to properly analyze the Booster 7 spin prime test, SpaceX crews prepared to once again get ready for a static fire of Ship 24, and this time, boy, did it deliver. We finally got a full-fledged six Raptor engine static fire out of this beast. The six engine count was confirmed by SpaceX on Twitter, but sadly, we got no official video from SpaceX, just a photo, though Lab Padre's streams were once again able to supply us with brilliant footage. Seeing this truly lit the world on fire. Uh, literally, I mean, the ship, it set, it set the ground ablaze, which then uh, continued burning well into the night. Oops. <laughs> now, last week I talked about how it was looking like SpaceX were removing the heat shielding of Ship 26 and beyond. And it's now pretty well speculated that this is because SpaceX are temporarily scrapping the reusability aspect of the upper stage in order to focus on getting the super heavy system working and to, more crucially, start launching Starlink V2, which is only launchable on Starship. I'm still not entirely sure if we'll see a completely bare bones upper stage in the expendable Starship vehicle. SpaceX may elect to retain the control flaps just so that the aerodynamics are the same during launch as the final iteration of Starship to help guide the development of future ships. Sushi Fox Studios whipped up this animation of what a Starlink V2 deployment might look like on a so-called bare bones Starship. It'll be interesting to see how this unfolds. Ship 25 is so far looking set to be the same as Ship 20 and Ship 24, complete with flaps and heat shielding, but it'll be interesting to see what happens when it's rolled out of the high bay to allow stacking of Ship 26. Will 26 be a silver bullet or more akin to a tireless SN8? Only time will tell, but the development of the expendable Starship is certainly one of the most interesting stories happening at Boca Chica right now. But yeah, looking like this, the rocket kind of looks like a big silver SLS, minus the SRBs of course, so uh, just a giant rocket I suppose. SLS, of course, in this context, stands for NASA's Space Launch System. But you know, there are plenty of other things that it could stand for like something like Squarespace, who have sponsored today's video. Squarespace is the number one place to build yourself a website. If you're an entrepreneur, business owner, creative type, or what have you, then you need a website. And no, this ain't the 1990s anymore. These days, a website has to look professional. And that's where Squarespace come in. 
they make making a professional website go from a horribly complicated affair to something that couldn't be simpler. If you can edit a Word document, then you're good to go. Tell Squarespace what website you want to make. For example, if you're a peddler of leaky rocket ships, choose from a list of professionally designed and curated templates and then get going. Don't feel restricted by the template either. You can change anything and everything about it to make your website truly tailored to your needs and your brand. If all of this sounds good, and it should, then go ahead and get started creating your online masterpiece today for free at www.squarespace.com. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash matlown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go on, do it now. Carve your place on the internet today. We close off the week with Ship 24 being supported by the SpaceX crane while workers continue to reinstall its heat shield tiles which were uh, farted off during the six engine Raptor static fire and the Mechazilla arms of the tower have been moved out and the Starship lifting pins have been extended in apparent preparation to stack Ship 24 on top of Booster 7. This could mean a 33 engine static fire with the Starship on top could be coming very very soon. I can't wait for next Monday's episode of Space This Week to talk about all of this with you. Our eye in the sky, Greg Scott, performed another flyover at Starbase Kennedy last week. I think the most immediately apparent thing in this overview shot is how substantial the Star Factory building now looks compared with just a few weeks ago. This thing is really springing up fast. We can also see that the SpaceX branded crane is now fully assembled and it looks ready to start assembling the new high bay for Starbase Kennedy. Tower segment number 9 is now looking basically ready to be moved out to pad 39A to be stacked on top of the launch tower, bringing the tower to full height. We can also see various other tower components scattered around the site which we believe will be used for the construction of a third Starship launch tower, though as of yet it's not quite clear exactly where this will be or why SpaceX want to build a third tower so soon. Right now at the pad, in this photo, section 8 is sitting by the tower ready to be stacked and as you can see the mystery tank is looking pretty tall now. It's a double layered tank if you look closely and this is probably as big as it's going to get now as the top dome for the inner tank is now sitting alongside the structure apparently waiting to be stacked as well as this shorter ring section for the outer tank wall. Last week, I didn't get to talk about the successful SpaceX Starlink mission on Sunday the 5th of September, since it happened a bit too close to my Space News video publication time, but I am pleased to say that it went well. This was the Starlink Group 420 and Varuna launch. The payload was 51 Starlink satellites deployed to Starlink Shell 4, as well as the Varuna technology demonstration mission, which comes from Boeing. It's designed to demonstrate various technologies and perform in-orbit testing of a V-band communication system, which will be used in Boeing's upcoming constellation of 147 broadband satellites. The Falcon 9 booster successfully landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, 640 kilometers downrange from the launch site, wrapping up the sixth flight for this booster, which previously supported two Falcon Heavy missions as well as four Falcon 9 flights. While we're on the subject of SpaceX Falcon, Justin Swartz caught this great footage of a Merlin engine static fire test, which of course is the engine that powers Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launch vehicles. With all talk about Raptor static fires, it's easy to forget that the Merlin is still a beast of an engine in its own right, and it can still pack a punch. A big launch event we saw last week was on the 7th of September. This was a launch of Ariane Space's flagship rocket, the Ariane 5, which took off from the French Guiana spaceport, carrying a single satellite to geostation Earth orbit. The satellite was the UTILSAT Connect VHTS, VHTS standing for Very High Throughput Satellite. This satellite is designed to provide high speed internet access throughout Europe with an instantaneous rate of 500 gigabytes per second. I do have a soft spot for the Ariane 5. I think, if anything, it just looks really cool. Better make the most of these launches then, because with the success of this mission, we only have three more Ariane 5 flights to look forward to before the rocket is retired and replaced with the Ariane 6. It'll definitely go out with a bang though, um, I mean a metaphorical one at least, hopefully, as its final launch is the very exciting JUICE mission, which is an acronym that stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. The spacecraft will study three of Jupiter's Galilean moons, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa, all of which are believed to have significant bodies of liquid water beneath their surfaces, making them potential harbourers of life. We saw a fairly massive mission from SpaceX on the 11th of September. A Falcon 9 launched 34 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit along with AST Space Mobile's Blue Walker 3 rideshare satellite. 
Blue Walker 3 is a massive satellite designed to test technologies to beam cellular communication, including 4 and 5G internet, directly from a satellite to mobile phones. Astronomers are a little bit concerned that this satellite may become the brightest object in the night sky, second to the moon of course, as this thing is huge. Once unfurled, it'll be about the size of a squash court, and remember how I said that this thing is a test satellite? The final version will be even bigger, and there'll be 110 of them. It will be interesting to see how competitive these satellites will be with SpaceX and T-Mobile's direct-to-phone Starlink satellite service. All of that aside though, for me personally, and I guess for many others, the coolest aspect of this mission was the landing of the Falcon 9 first stage on the drone ship A Shortfall of Gravitas. Why? Well, this is now a new record. This booster has now completed a whopping 14 flights in total, having previously flown the Crew Demo 2, Anasis 2, CRS-21, Transporter 1, Transporter 3, and 8 Starlink missions previously. Elon commented on Twitter saying that so far there has been no obvious limit to rocket reuse, so I'm really excited to see how many more flights SpaceX can squeeze out of this booster. Now, China had a very busy day on the 6th of September. We saw both a Kwaizu 1A launch and a Long March 2D launch. The Kwaizu 1A launched two satellites, the Centispace 1 S3 and S4, from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. Official sources have stated that these two satellites have successfully entered their intended orbits and will carry out technical verification tests such as navigation enhancement in orbit. The Long March 2D carried another batch of Yaugen 35 reconnaissance satellites to low Earth orbit. While it's pretty well understood that these are spy satellites, official sources are still sticking to the line that their use is for scientific experiments, land and resource surveys, agricultural production estimates, and disaster prevention. Well, I guess it can be both, right? <laughs> now check out this latest photo from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a picture of the Tarantula Nebula. The nebula got its name from the appearance of a tarantula's home. I'll show a picture of one, but don't worry arachnophobes, no spider will be visible. Tarantulas live in burrows lined with their silk, and the Tarantula Nebula does bear some resemblance to this. You can see in the James Webb photo the brown dirt with the burrow lined with white silk in the middle. Though, I think even the toughest of hard men would shudder at the size of the spider that spun this thing, given that this image of the nebula is 340 light years across. The Tarantula Nebula is the largest and brightest star-forming region among the galaxies closest to the Milky Way. One of the reasons that the Tarantula Nebula is so interesting to astronomers is that the nebula is similar in state to the massive star-forming regions present during the universe's cosmic noon, a period in time where the cosmos was only a few billion years old and star formation was at its peak. The star-forming regions in the Milky Way galaxy don't produce stars at anywhere near the same pace as the Tarantula Nebula, and they all have a different chemical composition. This makes the Tarantula Nebula the closest example, by distance, of what the universe was like during the time it reached its high noon, offering astronomers the chance to compare and contrast the star formation in the Tarantula Nebula with the James Webb Space Telescope's deep observations of distant galaxies from the actual era of cosmic noon, which is so strange to think about. We can actually go back and look at to the cosmic noon, thanks to this incredible telescope. One launch I'm not going to be able to cover today is the hopeful Sunday night launch of Firefly Alpha. This is their second mission, called To The Black, and will be the second orbital launch attempt of this rocket. It's not in today's episode of Space This Week, as it's just too close to publication time for me, but I'll be sure to cover it next week to keep you all up to date on how this went. Good luck, Team Firefly. I would now like to give a massive thank you to all the names on screen who make all of this possible by supporting me on Patreon and through my YouTube membership program. Sign up to either if you want to see your name in lights. Otherwise, there are two video suggestions on screen that YouTube thinks you'll like. Statistically, one of them is a Kerbal video, I know! Finally! So you can click that if you haven't seen it already. But guys, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.